Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to Vital Signs, your prescription for a healthy family, where members of the Catholic Medical Association explore medical topics vital to the health of you and your family members. I'm Dr. Tom McGovern, the host of Vital Signs, brought to you by Shalom World TV. Today, we examine the widespread problem of anxiety in children. While all children experience the emotion of anxiety, some of them respond to it with worry, dread, and rumination that cause intense suffering that prevents them from living the joyful lives God intends them to live. Some children experience anxiety in social situations. Others worry frequently about bad things that might happen in the future. And still others have extreme fears about specific things, like spiders, or situations, like going to the dentist. By the age of 13, nearly one in three children have had, or still have, a diagnosable anxiety disorder. And in a quarter of those, or about one in 12 children, anxiety severely impacts their everyday lives and significantly limits their ability to succeed in school, arrive at home, or enjoy playing with other children. The lifetime experience of suffering with anxiety is almost 50% more common in girls than in boys. And at any given point in time, about one in 14 children suffer from an anxiety disorder. But in the age group of 12 and over, that increases to one in 10 children. Yet, as we will learn, there are reliably effective ways to treat children suffering with anxiety. Joining us today is Dr. Larry Mitnall, a child psychiatrist practicing at Ascension Health Via Christi Clinic in Wichita, Kansas, where he lives with his wife and five children. Larry, welcome to Vital Signs. Thank you for having me. What, a, what an honor. Larry, what is anxiety and how is it related to worry? Um, worry is a part of the human condition. It's something that we all um, have as part of our makeup, as part of the way that we experience the world. And, and sometimes that part of our brain that's responsible for helping us to detect um, danger or identify um, stress can feel overwhelming and be so, so big um, that it causes people's lives to shrink a little bit. And so that's usually when we use the term anxiety or call it an anxiety disorder, meaning that the, the little, the, the stress that should be a manageable bite-sized piece um, that help our bodies to signal something that we should respond to um, ends up being something that can really take over. So is anxiety another name for worry or are they two different things? Yeah, often in the clinic we use them synonymously um, to talk about, you know, to talk about worry and anxiety. Um, but you know, pretty um, diagnostically speaking, we use anxiety disorder to describe a worry that's so strong that it's starting to limit and impact someone's day um, in some pretty profound ways. So maybe in the ways that they are, you know, interacting with family or the things that they avoid to do, maybe things that they previously um, enjoyed. And so when it's starting to have that level of of, of impact. It kind of raises to the level of anxiety, but really in common speech, we often use them to identify the same things. Just clinically, it's important for us to distinguish, is this a disorder, meaning, you know, is the anxiety so intense that it's causing um, a child or an adult to um, not be able to kind of fulfill and execute um, in the world in the way that they would like? So how does anxiety present in a young child, say under 10 years of age? Sure. Um, 
and it can have you know varied um, varied presentations. And I'll give you some some just really common um, examples. So it, for viewers who might, be, might not be familiar, imagine a kindergartner who's um, crying at school. Okay, and maybe that that little kindergartner is inconsolable about being separated from his or her mother. Now, despite everyone around him trying to you know console and comfort the child, um, the child can still express worry, and maybe that worry comes out also as um, worry about his mother and who he can't stop thinking about and wondering if she'll if she'll die if she's away from him. So um, so that's you know um, that's a, one of the ways in which um, anxiety can present in in really young kids, where you get a normal worry that's. Um, really kind of exaggerated or magnified um, to an extent that it's really impairing their day. Um, another example of maybe a, a young person under 10 would be, um, a, 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 you can imagine a, a, a young girl who um, has experienced some type of trauma. So perhaps um, her family's experienced a, you know, a fire where maybe they've lost some of their belongings, but they have managed to, you know, to survive and, and thrive. If this, if this same young girl, um, you know, three months later is having recurrent or repetitive um, nightmares about this past um, traumatic experience, that becomes, you know, an anxiety disorder that we're thinking about, you know, how do we help them to, to thrive and to manage those big emotions. And then if we move on to adolescents or teenagers, how might they present differently with anxiety than younger children? With the younger children, the examples that I gave you, you know, those are pretty concrete in that the kids can give examples. But often, our young um, kiddos will say things like, you know, their tummy hurts or they're having a headache. Um, maybe their heart is beating kind of fast or their hands are feeling kind of shaky. And so we might be looking for other kind of medical, you know, causes or sleep habits or things that might be related to that. And so sometimes they don't really have the vocabulary to express the emotions that they're feeling inside. Teenagers, conversely, have a little bit more of that layer of, of complexity. And so sometimes they're able to, to say those things a little bit more to us um, and to let us know that they're really having a hard time and, and that might be the way that they express it. Also, there are certain types of anxiety. So the examples earlier with you know the child having significant separation anxiety, that's not something that typically mm -hmm teenagers experience. They might be more you know, prone to experience something like um, some obsessional th thinking. So you can think of a child who, you know, maybe in the, in the recess of his mind, what brother hasn't pushed your button enough to make you think, hey, I want to give him a good sock on the nose, right? But the child who has that thought and can't let go of that thought, it keeps repeating, repeating over and over, even when he's not attempting to think about it. So that's another way that, you know, an older child might be able to express I just have this this thought that keeps cycling over and over that is getting stuck in my brain and I'm looking for a way to to you know feel better. Larry, when kids experience these uncomfortable feelings of anxiety, what are some of the ineffective ways they try to cope with it? One of the biggest is to avoid um, because the the difficulty is that avoidance does bring relief, but only temporarily. Um, and it's not a, a long game. You know, we grow developmentally when we learn how to master the challenges and then incorporate that in our life to move on and forward. And so often um, kids will instead shrink from the opportunity to, um, to you know, speak in front of the class or to participate in the club or activity or, or, um, or go to the restaurant and pay for, you know, pay for the food. They'd rather, you know, uh, shift that to somebody else. So avoidance is number one. The other can be um, silence. So sometimes our kids may have the answers for us about what's what's distressing them, um, but they might feel like it's it's too big to to say, and that saying it brings about more um, distress. So those are probably the two most common strategies that are ineffective that I see um, kids engaging in.